and there's this resistance, and then they might lobby against it to make sure that you're not allowed to do it. In North Carolina, they're trying to make uh, solar panels illegal, by the way. Oh. And then there's some sort of tragedy, you know, deep water rise in Fukushima, whatever it is, and then there's some sort of cleanup, and they box the cleanup, and there, there's all this outrage, and then all these hastily passed regulations that are just probably not good, and then nobody enforces them anyway, and the whole cycle begins again, and that's just what's been happening. So one of the things I do, you know, for fun, <laughs> is I look at environmental disasters. And if you look at the top 20 worst environmental disasters in human history, they've all occurred in the last generation. So we're not learning anything. We're not getting better. We're not improving as we're supposed to be. And yet, any time you try to like fix it, it just turns out that we're just, if you map all this, it just gets we're just polluting everything. I mean, unless we're all going to live in southern Australia, which is nice, but unless we're going to live in southern Australia, where else are we going to go? But if you try to pass something, it just met with this resistance. So this is probably the most uh, famous piece of environmental legislation. This is the Clean Air Act. And every bit of it, every time it was introduced, the industry, the coal industry, fought it. So with sulfur dioxide, for instance, they said, you can't make us do that. That'll cost $1,500 a ton. That's, that's uh, un-American, they said. And the EPA said, well, we did our own price, and we found it would be half that. And the actual cost is under $100 a ton. Because everybody had to do it. The same thing with benzene. You can't make us do that. That's more than a quarter of a million dollars a plant. We can't afford that. That's communism, or whatever you said. And the EPA said, well, actually, we priced it. It should be less than half of that. The actual cost was zero. Because everybody had to do it. And if everybody had to do it, they stopped making the plants that require benzene. It's just as simple as that. That's what regulation does. Regulation fuels innovation. It provides a level playing field for everybody. You all should become lobbyists and be championing as much recycling and waste processing as possible. You should be pushing for composting programs. And really, I, half my time now is spent arguing with lawmakers about crafting new laws. Yet anytime we talk about regulation, it's just we're told it's too expensive. But if you actually add up the cost of regulation, it's usually less than 1%. Some of it in the 3% range, and hardly any of it above 4%. So basically what they spend on donuts is what they're complaining about. <laughs> Which brings us to our next step in donut saving, the consumer donut saving. And the consumer donut saving doesn't realize how regulations can help all of us. Because I remember, I, I grew up, I went to school that had asbestos. And there was this wonderful month where they closed the school for three weeks just to get out all the asbestos. And my parents picked me up with this death trap of a school in a car that had no catalytic converter, no seatbelts, and it was filled with cigarettes. In it. And they drove me in this death trap to the dentist who gave me mercury fillings. And now this is child abuse. This is child abuse, basically. But this is what regulation does. It makes things better. We need to remember that. Which brings us to our next step of dose saving, the policymaker dose saving. And I deal with these guys all over the country. They're crazy. Because one on one, they're awesome. They're real because they're very, they're charming. You see why they get elected, because they're just really charming people. They're first on the issues. But you get them in front of their constituents, and they just become idiots. This is uh, Dana Rohrbacher, who's here in California. This is the guy that famously said, hey, I've got a plan to fix climate change. Let's cut down all the trees. Don't do that, by the way. Please don't do that. It'd be bad, it'd be really bad. He said this in front of people. <laughs> and it's here in California. It's not Mississippi, it's here. Then there's uh, John Huntsman. You remember he was running for president. He's the one that boldly stood up. He said, just to be clear, I believe in science. I believe in climate change. And this single handedly ended his presidential career, basically. I mean, this is complete lack of charisma, but still, you get the idea. So I deal with these guys all the time, and uh, it kind of works like this. As president of Planet Spaceball, I can assure both you and your viewers that there's absolutely no air shortage whatsoever. Yes, of course. I've heard the same rumor myself. Yes, thanks for calling, and not reversing the charges. Yes, bye. Considering it, and a week later, 
the city gets a letter from the Save the Plastic Bag Coalition. It's run by this lawyer named Stephen Joseph, and he basically says in the letter, if you continue pursuing this, we will sue the city. And so the mayor, in her infinite wisdom, says, what are you going to do about this? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. So I, I, did, I do what I do best. I said, well, I'll meet with them. I'll, 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 I'll reason with them. I'll, you know, I'll try to connect them. And, keep them <laughs> and, uh, and he's an intense guy, man. This guy's really, he's kind of creepy, actually. He's really intense. And he made me watch this movie with him. And this is how it works. Because we're suffering through things in our environment that have been persisting for decades. 
Decisions that seemed harmless enough 52 years ago and now are still affecting us. So that's what we need to change. I said to a developer, hey, let's grow food on the outside of the building. That'd be nice, right? Let's grow some food. And he said, you can't do that. Uh, the homeless people would eat it. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Be awful. And I said, calm down, calm down. Unless you start seeing this everywhere, it's not a problem. It's not really a problem. <laughs> you see this, we'll take, the, we'll take the food down. It's fine. So that's what I mean. Just to deal with this just dumb stuff. And besides, if you really want to make money, there's other crops you can grow anyway. You know? like, no, really. So that's when we need a long-term view of everything. We just have to stop thinking in these kind of quarterly terms. We need to stay, think more long-term. The trouble is that, uh, no, think about that, but if you really look back, in the 1930s and 40s, in a time of war, we asked people, in the name of victory, to make sacrifices. And I think people forget that. We asked people to ration certain materials because it safeguarded their share. And it was all done in the name of victory. So maybe that's what we need. Maybe we need a Rosie the River of the 21st century. Maybe we need one of you to stand up and be the recycling queen of, 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 of the poster child. Any volunteer? Look at what we asked people to do in the 1940s. Winterize your home. Walk. Can your food. Recycle. Scrap certain materials. And to do it all in the name of victory. And they did. Thousands, millions of people all collectively worked together to do this. And it was incredibly effective. And this is what we need again. <laughs> Part of the evidence of that is all the crumbling infrastructure that we've been having lately. And you hear and heard a lot about this infrastructure, right? And Hurricane Sandy was living proof that our infrastructure is not ready for a warming, wetter world. And most of the infrastructure was built in the 50s and 60s. It only had a 50-year lifespan, so it's overdue for replacement, which is why you've been hearing so much about it in the news. So I want to implement a plan. I call it the Mupu plan. I want to just show you this idea that I have for a plan that might help with the infrastructure. Now, uh... <laughs> So, all of you have driven between LA and San Francisco, I imagine, one time or another, and you've all passed this, right? This is, uh, this is Harris Ranch. And it's st sticky, roll through windows as you drive by. It's awful. Well, you're smelling methane. You're smelling methane. That's cow farts you're smelling, right? <laughs> and it's just right along the freeway there. You can't miss it. And um, so, you know, this place is just an icky, gross, disgusting place where cows just wait to die. So, because of that, I call this place Cashwood. <laughs> Recycled the, the parts and the poops and, and made energy with it. And we can regenerate enough energy to power all of California. Not to mention that, uh, the potential for this is not just in California, but everywhere. All over the US has the potential for this biogas, they call it. And not only that, it's, it's better for the cows. I mean, imagine if the only thing that we really wanted for the cows is not their meat, but just their, their burps and their farts. Wouldn't that be one that we want to do? So that's what I mean when we need to look at infrastructure in a new way. And if we real build it now, not only can we create millions of jobs, but we can do it right this time. We can actually shave efficiency 30% at least. The trouble is, anytime I talk about infrastructure, I mean, look at your faces. You're bored out of your mind. You don't want to get mad. Infrastructure is boring. I want to be just, you know, I want to be light and free. I just want to have fun all the time. Okay. I get it. That's fine. Maybe you'd rather have something, you know, like this. For the one old guy in the room that doesn't know, uh, this is a Korean rapper, Sai, and he's got a song, you see. And as of this morning, it's been watched 1.7 billion with B times. It's over four minutes long. So if you do the math, which I did for you, 1.7 billion times four and a half minutes is 14,000 human years. 14,000 human years spent watching. This. I get it, it's cute, it's cute. Once, twice, maybe, it's cute. But 14,000 years worth? And that's, you know, like, we could have we had jetpacks by now. You realize that? If we were watching this, we had jetpacks. It would have been awesome. If you want to spend four minutes watching something, watch something educational at least, like at least get smarter while you're doing it, you know, you want to, you know, escape. 
Because you're not fooling anybody. Nobody thinks this is grass, right? You're, you know, you didn't just see many of us. And the same civilization, like they can't touch soap. I need to touch the soap, but it can't touch soap's too dirty. <laughs> the same people that eat pink slime in their cheeseburgers, they won't touch soap. That's weird to me. It's just strange. And this is the same country that when it looked like Obama was going to win re-election, they said, that's socialist, I'm moving to Canada. <laughs> Prime Minister there, I've met her, she's nice. It's a third woman, gay, socialist. That's like a hat trick. I mean, they're heavy. So go, go to Canada, enjoy it, love it, we love it there. We get distracted by things that aren't, not news, they're just not news. We just like these things that just move other things out of the way. Ethan Zuckerman has this great idea, he said the Kardashians should be unit of attention. Oh, climate change received 0 0.001 Kardashians today. <laughs> and it's not just them. I mean, if I ever see him in Calabasas, I'm going to punch him in the face. I'll tell you that. It's not just them. But it's like all this other just annoying like morons that we have to listen to. It's not news. I'm, I become like my grandfather. I just yell at the TV all the time. That's not news. It's just annoying. And, and that's why we just, ugh, we just feel bad about ourselves all the time. Just, ugh. <laughs> And then there's this massive conspiracy, I don't know if you know this, but People Magazine, where one week they tell you you're too fat, and the next week you're too thin, and the next week you're too fat, and the next week you're too thin, and it's just, I, can know, I know what date it is based on the cover of the magazine, if I'm too fat or too thin now. That's what it's come to. And yet, you know, uh, over a dozen years I've been speaking all over the country, I've spoken about 200,000 people all over, the, all over the world, really. And every now and again, people will get up and leave. And when they leave, they leave when I say these two words. They freak out when I say these two words. And when they leave, they cover their ears. Which is weird to me, they have any knowledge coming in. And it's always been, the people that have always gotten up and left have always been old white baby boomer men. It's always been them. Women are too nice, they would never do that. And so, and this affects me. Like the, and so the other day I was just sitting daydreaming, uh, you know, just sitting off in space, and I started fantasizing about the time when all the old white baby boomers were gonna die. Like that's just an awful thing. I shouldn't be thinking that. What a terrible thing. This guy here is a lovely, I'm sure he's a lovely man. Sunships, Sunships 
came out with this new bag. I know some of you heard about this. Yeah. This biodegradable bag. What a great, wonderful gesture. What a wonderful idea. Uh, and Americans complain. Man, when I open the bag, it's too noisy. I can't hear myself shove the chips in my fat face. <laughs> To, uh, I was working on the sustainability plan for the city of Cleveland in Ohio. <laughs> uh, and um, I said to them, what's it cost you to throw something away? And they knew right away, oh, it's $30 a ton to throw something away in Cleveland. I said, what's it cost you to recycle? And they didn't know. And they went and looked it up. And they said, actually, they pay us $26 for every ton we recycle. And as soon as they said that aloud, they realized, oh crap, we're losing $56. <laughs> <laughs> so now they're instituting a mandatory recycling program. No, I don't. You cheer them. They're, they're, they're not here. You don't need to cheer them. <laughs> we spend, as a, as a species, we spend more on, schools spend more on throwing trash away than they do on textbooks. So our priorities are out of whack. We really prioritize the wrong thing. And yet, if we live things by their intention, by their re ramification, by their out output, this, is, this can change behavior. And doing this is smart. And if you don't do it, it's dumb. It's really dumb. It's just really smart. <laughs> So things like this are not supposed to happen in this country. This is supposed to be, that's a, some other country. But this is not happening in both of these things are happening on American soil. So this is no longer just a resource problem. This is a human rights problem. This is an equality problem. This is something even bigger. So that's what I mean by saying when we just toxified everything and we just destroyed everything. But perhaps it was said best by my friend Louis. We ruined everything here. This was the great, it was just coast to coast, just green, brown, and beautiful, and, and all the just walking around with clean faces, just walking, and they'd be like, ooh, that looks yummy, and they just eat from the ground, and then they'd sleep on the grass, and then they'd go for a swim and do a little dance. That was the whole continent, was just folks doing that. Now, if you show a five-year-old these logos, they'll be able to tell you pretty much all of them. It's really uncanny. But they wouldn't be able to identify these leaves. <laughs> Which, by the way, you can totally fix with this app that I found. It's totally cool app. I'm not making this up. It's a real app. And you download it. It's free. You download it. Call me University. So nature has just become forgotten. It's just become like roadkill in the road of progress. We're just kind of like lost sight. Really? Really? All right. What we need to realize is that nature is our solution. Nature has the answer. Nature is the ultimate technology because nature doesn't create waste. Everything in nature is regenerated for something else. Everything in nature becomes food for something else. That's what you people do for a living. You're good at it. We need to realize that nature is the ultimate technology. And if we do that and we embrace that, we can pave a roadmap for how to get out of this place. One way to do that is by looking at resilience. And this word resilience is going to be the watchword. No, that goes. For the next uh, decade, really. And what resilience means is making our buildings that last better. Because I'll show you an example. This is Nagasaki, this is right after the bomb in 1945, and here it is again after the tsunami flood. And I really just have one question for you people. What the hell did they make that arch out of? <laughs> <laughs> Hurricane Sandy last November really showed us that we are not resilient, that we are not prepared. But images like this haunted New York, because it wasn't supposed to happen here. You've all seen this TV show, So You Think You Can Dance, or you've heard of it anyway, I don't really watch it. But maybe instead of So You Think We Can Dance, maybe we need to focus on resilience. Maybe what we need is, hey, you think you can build a well? Like, maybe that's what we need, is to <laughs> teach people about resilience. That's what's needed. What we need to do is we need to inject nature in everything we do. We need to use it as our guide, as our model. We need to focus on creating living buildings, regenerative buildings, buildings that grow in place and fix the damage we've done. And if we do this, not only does it make people happier, it improves the economy. And we now have studies that prove this. So least least needs my last epidote of sapien, which is really all of you, the actors. And I started to put on you. Really, it's you. It's up to you. No one else will do it. The way to do this is to really just plant a bold vision. Everyone you meet, tell them about a world of net zero waste. And show them that it's possible. Show them that you're able to do it. And this bold vision will get people excited. It'll elicit their response. They'll want to help you. They'll want to know how it's going to be possible. Don't wait to be asked. It really is just too late for that. Because, I don't know if you realize this, but we're number one in the world for garbage production. We're also number one in a lot of other things, like total energy use, per capita energy use, and of course carbon emissions and oil consumption. So let's not be number one in garbage production anymore. 
Let's find a way to head towards zero waste. Because there's one more thing that we're um, number one in. And that, of course, is obesity. So the very last thing I want to leave you with is a plan of how we could possibly fix this. Now, uh, on average, a third of all Americans are fat, and another third are obese. That's a body mass index of a certain type, right? And so it's a lot of basically fat people. Nobody in this room, other people, you've seen them. And, uh, and uh, I like to call that remaining third skinny nerds. That's really how I refer to them. And uh, so this two-thirds of Americans that are rather large, uh, there's about 72 million of us around. And this gave me an idea that I want to share with you. First of all, not only does it have major health care costs, 300,000 uh, deaths a year, that's 117 million in health care, it's a big issue, right? And not only that's getting worse, because by 2030, 86% of us will be fat or obese. It's just getting worse and worse. And it turns out that there's simple things you can do. Just by living in a walkable neighborhood, you can decrease uh, your risk of obesity by 6%. So if you've got a one-hour commute, 6%. Two-hour commute, you're not 6% lighter, just 6% more likely to be obese. And it's not just these people, I mean anybody, like it's just 6% no matter every hour you commute and walk instead. And yet if you live in a walkable neighborhood where you can walk to restaurants and shops and things, it decreases your overall risk of obesity by 35%. By the way, Flabby is a perfect name for this slide, don't you think? Perfect. All right. So all of this gave me kind of a weird idea. And it's a little unconventional, and I please don't walk out of the room uh, upset. But it's, I want to share this room with you, and I call this idea like a diesel. My friend calls it Vaseline, but I think that's old. <laughs> and basically what this idea is, 72 million obese Americans, from each one, we can suck out at least 50 pounds of fat out of each one. At least. $5,000 for the average cost of life of suction, it's a lot of money, $360 billion for the whole surgery. That's a lot of money up front. But from each one, at least 50 pounds of fat, and each pound of fat is about, about half a billion potential gallons of fat fuel that we can suck out. <laughs> each gallon is 125,000 BTUs of energy, pure energy, just pure juicy energy out of each one. And from that, 64 quadrillion BTUs of energy that we can produce just from fat fuel. And it makes everybody skinny again. And the best part is, they'll fatten up again. They'll fatten up again. It's fine. It's, uh, it's renewable. It's, you do all the math, which I did for you. It's less than half a penny per BTU. It's the cheapest form of energy on the earth. We solved the energy crisis. You're, you're welcome. Look at your, your faces are a mix of like horrified. And you're like, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. And it's so, but it's. it's great. Imagine how happy all those fat people will be knowing that they've shaved 3.2 million metric tons of CO2 every single day. They're just dancing for sure, aren't they? And it's enough to power about 800,000 homes a year. So it's a, like it adds pretty quickly. Um, and if you don't want to do heat energy, we can do thermal energy. It's about 1.21 gigawatts of energy per person if you want to do electrical for the electricals in the room, which is what Marty and Dr. Rodney even powered the door in, which is just a weird coincidence. That's just a weird. I don't know that. All right. Um, Every building should aspire to do five things. And we try to do this on all of our products. We don't always do it. In fact, most of the time we don't, but we aspire to do it. First is, every building should try to grow a portion of its own food. Second, every building should try to generate some of its own power. Every building, third, should at least try to clean some of its own water, by remediation, swales, whatever you want. Fourth, every building should process some of its own waste on site, which, by the way, can help you generate energy. And if you do all four of those things combined, the fifth thing, every building should sequester its own carbon. If you do the first four correctly, you'll do this automatically. That's our goal. If you want to see more how to do this, you can download the Living Building Challenge for free. It's like weed, but weed on steroids. And the reason it's called a challenge is because it's, it's hard. It's really hard. There's only been like 14 buildings that have gone all the way through, but it's very impressive. So you can look at the checklist for free. Arthur C. Clarke famously said that any sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from magic. That if aliens were to come down here, we would just think them magical. Bruce Sterling had one that I think that you would like. He said we'd be indistinguishable from our garbage. That's cute, whatever. But I tweaked this a little bit. Any sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from nature. That if we do our jobs correctly, we wouldn't be able to tell the mind where mankind stops and nature begins. Because nature has 3.8 billion years of research and development ahead of us. 3.8 billion years that we can learn from. And if we just stop to think and try to be smarter and think our way out of this mess, we can stop being go to sapiens. In fact, what we can do is actually plant a plan for victory for what the 21st century could be and make a roadmap out of it. That being said, you can email me at all the usual places here and there, and of course, uh, Jessica and Tracy can reach me. And then, of course, you can download these slides uh, at dotosapiens.com. But otherwise, that's my time, and thank you all for not leaving.